The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Be at rest once more, O oh my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, O oh Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. LBIC is a community being transformed by the love of Jesus, sharing this love with all people. Our desire is for this online video content to be an extension of our community, allowing for a visual and more personal connection with familiar voices, helping us think about how to follow Jesus in our particular moment. So enjoy the video, and we hope to see you soon in person. Hey Lancaster BIC family, it's good to be with you again. Uh, two things as we begin. Uh, first, from uh, next week on, I would encourage you to have communion elements ready anytime you sit down to watch this message part of what we give you each week. Uh, because I'm going to be leading us through receiving communion together. Just because we're not in person doesn't mean we can't participate 
in this experience of being the body of Christ together. So from starting next week on, make sure you have some bread and some juice or some bread and some wine or whatever you want to use as elements. You can be creative too. Uh, if you want to with your kids, you can make it just something that's fun. Um, but we're going to begin that next week. Uh, secondly, I want to begin this, uh, this time together with just a word of prayer. Uh, because there are just such a variety of experiences that all of us are having. And so I just want to bring all those together uh, to the Lord uh, to, together today. So would you join me in a word of prayer and then we'll dive in. Jesus, I thank you even though we're not together, uh, we are together and we are united as one in Christ. God, you are the one that keeps us together. You are our common bond. Uh, you are the head of the body, the church. And even though we're not able to be uh, the church in person right now, God, we continue to carry one another in our hearts. And I pray that you would help us to continue to do that, to carry one another in our hearts, Lord. And God, I bring to you and we carry to you and we bring to you our brothers and sisters today who... Uh, maybe are suffering anxiety or fear because of the unknown. Uh, God, those things are actually for all of us just below the surface. And so we just want to bring one another to you, God, and pray for the peace that passes all understanding to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And so be with us as, as we just pay attention to the scriptures together today. Lord, we are being formed and shaped as a community together, so it's not just about me and you, Jesus. It's not just about our relationship together, uh, but it's about us as a community of faith and how we're being formed and shaped together. And so use this time together today to, to continue to form and shape us. And we pray these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. So today what we're going to do is dive into Ruth chapter 2. We're taking a break from the lectionary uh, throughout this short season, uh, the short series that we're doing on the book of Ruth. I really think the book of Ruth has a lot to say to us about how to be the church, how to be the people of God during this time, and so we want to be attentive to those things and learn from this book together. Uh, before we go into Ruth chapter 2, we just want to recap a little bit from last week because we're carrying over what we talked about last week into this week. And so last week we talked about this idea of solidarity th over security, or finding security through solidarity. Uh, so solidarity is this choice to uh, work for the good of others, to unify yourself and, and in the situation that somebody else finds themselves in, to, to um, find solidarity with them, find companionship with them in that. And so uh, the one thing that we talked about last week was this myth of progress that is very prevalent within Western civilization, particularly in the United States. We have our own version of it called the American Dream, but I used this metaphor of a ladder, or this imagery of a ladder last week. And how the myth of progress or the American Dream works is if you're a uh, picture of the ladder and you're on one rung of the ladder, what you want to do is progress up the ladder. So your, your vision for life is always up. You want to be moving up. And one of the things that happens as uh, you continue to move up this ladder uh, is that the voices that you have left behind eventually become drowned out to the point where you can't hear them anymore. And this is true economically, uh, especially as people move up the economic ladder, we become less and less attentive to those uh, who have less and those who are in need. That is a part of the system. That is a part of the way that the system is set up. And you and I swim in this, whether uh, we like it or not. One of the things that we have to name is that we swim in these waters. And so uh, the call to us that our culture and the pressures of our culture uh, call out to us or, or kind of push us into is move up the next rung of the ladder. And the affects of that then are the more that we move up, the less and less we hear about those who are on the bottom. Uh, and what we want to do as followers of Jesus is not climb that ladder, but we want to choose security through solidarity. 
So not security through climbing up the ladder, because there's never a point when you really do achieve security. Um, but we want to choose security through the relationships that we continue to invest in of those around us. Um, we want to choose solidarity with one another, being in relationship with one another, rather than climbing up the ladder and doing our own thing, improving our own life not just focusing on us individually speaking. So solidarity emphasizes community. This, this myth of progress, there is no sense of community. It's all about the individual and it's about the individual progress. And so uh, we want to choose solidarity um, and we want to choose finding security through being in solidarity with one another. And we find this in the book of Ruth. And last week we looked at chapter one and how Ruth chose solidarity uh, over the safety of going back to her hometown once her husband died. The, the natural thing would have been to, for her to go back to her hometown, remarry, start her own family all over again. That would have been her safety and her security. But instead, what she chose to do is live in solidarity with Naomi. And uh, because of that, this treacherous journey that this older woman that Naomi would have taken by herself, she doesn't take by herself, but she has a companion. And so they journey back to Israel from Moab together. And so we're going to pick up in Ruth chapter 2 today because we want to pay attention to how to create space spaces of solidarity in our lives. We want to pay attention to how to create spaces of solidarity in our lives. And I'll be very upfront with you as we begin this, this, uh, this, this time together today. It focuses a lot on economics. It focuses a lot on economics and how we use our economics, how we view economics, how we view our, our, our money and what we have. And so chapter two is going to give us a lot of instruction, a lot of ways to imagine what this might look like uh, um, among us as, as we live through this time uh, together and as we look to be deliberate about choosing solidarity with one another. So let's look at Ruth chapter two and, and dive in together here today. Ruth chapter two, I'm gonna read the whole thing, uh, maybe give some commentary at one part or another, but it says, now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, which was her husband, uh, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter, so she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Now let's pause there. Um, we're told about Boaz in the beginning so that we're aware that Ruth has absolutely no idea of this before going into uh, this field. So we, as the reader, are aware of it. The narrator wants us to be aware of it more for the purposes of seeing, okay, God's hand is guiding Ruth here. Now, Ruth's activity is an activity that is common both to those who are poor and needy and also to those who are foreigners or sojourners or who are refugees. Ruth fits both of those categories. She is a Moabitess. She's not from the land of Israel. And so what they would do, what people who are in need would do at, those, at that time, would glean or pick up the leftovers, the scraps, from the fields of the folks that are within their town or their village. So this is how they provide, the poor would provide for themselves. This is just something uh, that societally is very normal. So Ruth is participating in this, um, in this very common practice. Picking up at verse four. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, he said. The Lord bless you, they answered. And then Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, well, she's the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind your harvesters. She came into the field and has remained there from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me, don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. At this, uh, Naomi, or Ruth is just perplexed. She bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? 
And Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and your mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now, I want to pause here for a moment because how we speak of the relationship between Ruth and Boaz is incredibly important. There is a way that you could read this passage of Scripture that would objectify Ruth. And that is not the way that we want to read this passage of Scripture, because as you look at how Boaz and Ruth's relationship progresses over a period of time, this is not a relationship where Boaz is objectifying Ruth. So you're not going to read, and I would strongly discourage the reading of this this. This line when uh, Boaz asked the overseer of his harvest in, in verse 5, who does that young woman belong to? I would strongly uh, encourage you not to read it like, who does that young woman belong to? That's not the point at all. That, that reading isn't even uh, substantiated or supported uh, by the rest of the, the reading of the book of Ruth. Rather, we have to understand that and say, what does this what does what Boaz is doing right now tell us about Boaz and about his character? Because what really is happening is Ruth is among uh, the, the poor and needy who are in this field getting what they have for their sustenance because that's just what they, they do. But she's somebody who's new on the scene. And this would have been recognizable to Boaz. So he's involved with the people who are taking part in gleaning his land, whether it's harvesting and the people who work for him or the people who are gleaning on the land. Uh, there, there is a compassionate heart that Boaz has. And so he wants to know who this person is. Now, when, when he first addresses Ruth then, um, and, and, and she says, why have I found favor in your sight? Boaz tells her why. It's because of what you have done. Now, in my language, you've chosen solidarity with your, with your mother-in-law when you had no obligation to do so. The Lord bless you for that. So there is this faith posture that Boaz has in response to what Ruth has done. And we'll see this as it moves throughout this chapter. He wants to bless Ruth, not only with, with this ability to glean from his fields, but in, in a minute he'll invite him to, or he'll invite her to his table. Uh, he'll in, give instructions, uh, not only to protect her, but to prevent her from being shamed. Um, he'll, he'll tell his harvesters, look, just when you harvest some stuff, instead of putting it in your own sheath, just leave it go and let her pick it up so it's not as hard for her. He has just a lot of compassion, and it's his way of saying, I want to honor what you have done to honor God. I want to honor what you have done to honor uh, your mother-in-law, Naomi. And so this is Boaz's way of honoring Ruth. This is Boaz's way of honoring Ruth. And so we want to... Ruth is just... Both of these people are people of character, and we want to lift that to the, the surface because, again, we want to remind ourselves that what we're, what we're reading here tells us something about how the kingdom of God works. How the kingdom of God works. Okay? So let's continue on in verse 13 and following. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servants. Though I do not have the standing as one of your servants, so he's treating her differently. Then at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar, which I would imagine just makes it a little more tasty. <laughs> right? When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. So she has a place among the harvesters, again, a place upon uh, among his employees, so to speak. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. Then as she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather from among the sheaves and don't reprimand her, don't shame her. Even pull out some of the stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So don't shame her, but actually provide for her. Be gracious to her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. <coughs> Excuse me. Until evening. 
Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to an ephath. So this is about 22 liters, 22 liters, which is significant, of grain. She carried it back into town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over from when she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed is the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she had been working. And she said, The name of the man that I worked for or with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing kindness to the living and the dead. She added, This man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen or guardian redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all of my grain. So this is not just an invitation to return the next day, but harvest is a season. Harvest is a season. So the invitation to Ruth from Boaz is to spend the season there in his fields. So Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it would be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. Again, this is not a safe time for women in, in Israel's day and age and in their culture. It was a very dangerous time. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and the wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Now, what I'd like to do is just look at this person, a Boaz that we're introduced to, and look at how he's intentional to live his life and use his resources in a place of solidarity. And so he creates spaces of solidarity. Um, for Ruth specifically, he creates a safe space. Now, we're going to assume that the space that he creates for Ruth, he's creating also for the other women who are working among him. Now, it is... It is um, kind of the social path for women to be taken advantage of during this time. And so in verse 11, Boaz is very instructive with the, the men who work for him. Don't touch, don't touch her, hands off. You know, do not disturb her. And, and Naomi even says that she's very well aware of how women are treated. In this place, she's, she says, you're going to be safe here. You're, you're in somebody else's field, there might be things that happen to you. But in this field, you're going to be safe. And so Boaz is using his sphere of influence and his resources to create a place of safety and security for Ruth. And we're going to extrapolate that because we see this also taking just the character uh, of Boaz in, within this book of Ruth. We're going to extrapolate that and, and say that he's creating the space for those who are in his sphere of influence. Now, this is not the norm. This is not the norm in his time and in this, uh, this time in Israel's history. So he's creating a space that is secure. Another thing that he is doing is economic in nature. Okay, So keep in mind, they, they have just come out of a time of famine. Now, if you're coming out of a time of famine when things are super scarce, what is going to be the probable inclination? The probable inclination is to scoop up every little bit, last bit of grain to make sure you have enough. But this is not what Boaz is doing. Boaz is, is following the Levitical law that provides for the poor and needy. So this is what Leviticus 19, 9, and 10 says. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner, for I am the Lord your God. And so one of the things that it means to live under the lordship of Yahweh at that time, uh, for us to live under the lordship of Jesus, then is to say that my extra for Boaz, the edges of his field, are not for him to milk everything that he can get out of them, but are meant then to provide for the poor and the needy that are among them. So whether it's the grain field or the olive groves or um, the vineyards, which would be their, their main uh, staples of crops, any of those things, they're not supposed to, to take every little 
ounce that they can get out of it, but they're supposed to leave some behind in order to care for the poor. Now, in this time and this place, what Boaz is doing is not normal. Again, this is the time of the judges. Verse 1, chapter 1 says, this is the time of the judges. And the time of the judges is one of the darker times in Israel's history. And so for a man to uh, of, of means and wealth and stature to continue to follow the Levitical laws during this time is significant. It says something about him. And it says something about how he's using, uh, how he's using what he has. And so instead of hoarding, he continues to give. He continues to give. Um, and so let's bring Boaz and Ruth together now. Okay? Because uh, I call Boaz Ruth 2.0. Okay? The story really is about this woman, Ruth. We don't want the story just to move into Boaz because he's the person of means. The story begins with and is built upon this person of Ruth. A woman who, instead of choosing safety and security in, through remarriage and returning to her hometown, binds herself to her mother-in-law and to an unknown future. And so everything that happens is a result of this initial act of solidarity and faithfulness. So Boaz is Ruth 2.0. He is in a de different economic position, certainly, but he's continuing this solidarity. He's, con he's continuing to choose to use his life and to, to not just gain for himself in a time where gaining for yourself and doing whatever you see fit is, is kind of the name of the game within the, the nation of Israel. But he's choosing solidarity and to use what he has to continue to provide for the poor and the needy that are a part of his town or his village, the surrounding areas, or the, the foreigner who might come in. And so Ruth is, is one of those, those people. And so what I think is important to draw out here is that it doesn't matter your economic capacity. Choosing solidarity doesn't mean that, oh, People with means are the people who choose to be in solidarity with another. It's, it's not an economic decision. It's actually a decision of the heart. It's a decision of the heart whether we're going to choose to identify with the good of others rather than just looking out for myself. So choosing solidarity does not depend on economics. Um, the, the choice to be in solidarity with one another is a choice of the heart. It's a choice of opening our heart to the hospitality, uh, to, to give hospitality to others. And, and hospitality is not just the table that we set, so to speak. Our hearts have to be hospitable as well. In other words, we must cultivate a heart of hospitality if we are going to engender an environment of hospitality. And so hospitality is something that comes from within, not only like verbal hospitality, but the hospitality that Boaz is creating with his resources uh, comes because of the hospitality that's been curated in his, in his heart. And I would suggest that that's a hospitality that we as the people of God want to curate as well. Uh, I, I want to spend just these last few minutes paying attention specifically to this idea of gleaning of the fields, um, this idea from last week as well, from Acts 2 and 4, where, where the people of God, uh, it, was, it was said of them that there were no means, uh, or no, um, there were no needs among them. And I want us to think about economics for a bit. Uh, I am not a doomsday person, and I am not a conspiracy theorist. Um, but I am somebody who's pretty pragmatic, and I can imagine that the economic needs um, that this pandemic is engendering are going to be significant, and they're going to take place over a longer period of time. So I don't, I don't think it's going away in three months or six months or whatever. And so here's my question to us. This is in a time when we're not out, we're not... Uh, for those of you who have means, you're not spending money on extra stuff, really. And we're not spending it on gas or any of that kind of stuff. 
but this is a time really of recentering um, and 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 paying attention to what we value in our lives and what we want to use our lives for. Now specifically let's think about our financial resources. If we use this principle uh, and, and we use the Old Testament principle of the tithe to guide our tithing principle of 10% of our income, but if we use this, this also uh, idea of gleaning, which I think is, is very useful and guiding for us to use, what does that mean for our finances? For the times where we have more than enough, and that's going to vary from person to person, um, but each of us will, I think each of us will experience there's going to be a time where there's more uh, than enough, whether it's this much more or this much more. The question then is how do we think about those means? The myth of progress would tell you or, or would cause us to think, okay, I have these extra means now. How do I move up the ladder or how do I get the next thing or how do I secure for myself uh, however long the future is? That would be the myth of progress. I think for the kingdom of God, the question is for, for you and I, as we think about the extra that we have, and as we think about the extra that we have right now, is how do we steward this in such a way where it is available to others in their time of need? And so we're making choices now, financially speaking, that are going to put us in solidarity with people down the road as they have needs. And so um, that means that the extra income that we might have now, not everybody's going to have now, but the extra income that we have now, we can be setting aside and we can be open-handed with saying that my extra again, like we said last week, is your sustenance. And so in this time, I, I, I mean, I think on a number of levels, this is a time of preparation for the church, both a preparation for the church to minister to the world, uh, and also a preparation um, uh, for the church to, to care for, for one another. And so how do we use our economics now the extra that we have now, how do we set that aside with the mentality of saying, this isn't mine, but this is somebody else's. This isn't mine, but this is somebody else's. Um, because uh, one of the things that we find in the New Testament, specifically as a people of God, one of the things that sets apart the people of God is this desire to give and to take care of one another and to be generous to one another. And so as we think financially into the future, one of the, uh, there's a couple things that we need to think about. One, um, Again, I think about Galatians 6.10 that says, make sure that we are doing good, especially to the family of God. And so, uh, again, back to the Acts 2 and 4 principles, uh, we want to make sure that we are providing for the needs of our church family. We wanna, and uh, so we want to make our funds available uh, to that, whether that's now and the needs arise now or whether that's down into the future. Um, but then secondarily, and we're doing this through the neighbor fund too, we want to provide for the needs of those that are, are around us as well. And so I just want to challenge you all as, as you think about a very practical way to live in solidarity with one another. Um, a very practical thing to do is just to think about your economics. To think about the money that you are given to steward, um, whether it's a lot or a little. It doesn't matter. Um, there, giving is a joy. I, I, I love to give. Um, and and I just, I just want to challenge us to... I, I don't want us to buy into this lie of, of trying to secure for ourselves our own future. I just... I, it's a load of something. I... I our, our security is found in the solidarity that we have with one another in the life that we share together. And I think one of the lies that's been told to the church is, you know what, money is one of those things we just keep real private. Um, but you know what, it, I would all, I would all, I, I, I'm off script now, right? Um, but, um, in, in terms of preparation, too, uh, I, I think this is a time where 
folks are going to be seeking out meaning and faith and life, and they're going to bring needs that are with them. So it's not only about providing for the church family that we have now, but it's providing for the church family that we have a year from now, and it's providing for the church family that we have three years from now. It's, it's, it's uh, the people who are going to be joining us, who are going to be coming in, who are going to be in their own places of need. And it's not like, wait a second, you have to be here for a year before we minister to any of your needs. No, part of being a part of the family of God is sharing life together and choosing solidarity with one another and, and making sure uh, that we have what, what we need. And so even a way to prepare for the future is to look at how we are thinking about our economics now, how we're thinking about our money now, whose we think our money is, and preparing uh, to, to be open-handed with it. Because I think that's what the gleaning principle from Leviticus 19 means. We don't try to squeeze every little bit that we can out of our lives and out of our income, but we want to have edges in our lives. And so that's my question to you. How can you create edges that provide for other people? Or what do you do with the edges? How do you steward the edges that, that is not just about getting you the next thing or securing for yourself a sense of security, but how do you set that aside for the sake of others? I'm not talking about tithes and offerings now. I'm not talking about 10%, okay? What I, so I get, I get money. 10% of that, or I get a paycheck, 10% of that is, is tithes and offerings. Then there's everything I've got to do and pay as part of my life and part of my living. But then for those of us who have extra, or as we have extra and as we find extra, what is our mentality with that? What is our mentality with that? How can we use that for kingdom purposes? How can we use that open-handedly where we can be generous with it? Where we can be generous with it. So I encourage us, uh, I, would, I would encourage us to wrestle with our concepts of, of money uh, during this time, and I would encourage us to just pray for uh, uh, and, and be thoughtful, intentionally thoughtful about um, how do I set what is my excess aside for the needs of somebody else. So with that, uh, I, I just leave you with that challenge um, because I think it is an important component of discipleship during this time. It's always been an important part of, of discipleship, but I think it's one that is raising itself to the surface. At least it's one that I've been thinking about uh, a lot. And so I encourage you, I encourage you to join me. I encourage you as families, as husbands and wives to talk about this. How do we choose solidarity? How do we prepare to be in solidarity with uh, others by the choices that we're making with our finances now with the edges of our fields now? With that, um, I hope this is encouraging and challenging uh, and also moves you forward uh, in your own discipleship. Um, but God bless you all. Peace be with you. We are in this together, and I pray that God continues to use us um, and prepare us to be used uh, during this time. God bless you.